What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Culture FC, the weekly soccer show that covers all culturally relevant aspects of the beautiful game. We talk about politics, fashion, music, lifestyle, all the things surrounding the beautiful game, just none of the stuff happening on the pitch. My name is Louie, and I'm joined here with my two amazing co-hosts, Alan and Brendan. What is up, everyone? And this week, we got to talking about naturalized or foreign-born players on national teams and how it impacts not only that team but also the country that supports it you have a lot of players historically and currently in this world cup that were either born in a different country raised in a different country but ended up playing for another national team players like Miroslav Klose, Lucas Podolski, Patrick Vieira, Patrice Sevra and even the legendary Portuguese player Eusebio were all born in other countries and ended up representing the country that they're best known for Currently at this World Cup, we have a lot of different players, and I think it might have even hit its peak with the amount of foreign-born national players. So we thought it'd be a good time to dive into what that means, how that impacts the world, what it does to the World Cup, and just really try to get all of our ideas out on uh, one podcast. If you can't get enough of us, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at culturef.c. We post a lot of behind the scenes pictures, a couple of memes here and there, just things you don't get to see or hear in the weekly show. The three of us also have our own fashion clothing line inspired by soccer. It is called Treble and you can find us on Instagram at Treblewear, T-R-E-B-L-W-E-A-R. Give us a follow there, check out the website. Maybe you'll like something, maybe you'll buy something. Help us out. If you have any friends or family that love soccer and love to hear interesting takes on the culturally relevant aspects of the beautiful game, share this podcast with them. I know that we're asking for a lot here, but we also ask that you leave us a review on iTunes, on Google Play, wherever it is that you may get your podcast, please leave us a review. The more reviews we get, the better we rank in the search rankings and the more people get to listen to it. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. So while you're listening to or watching this episode, leave us a comment or contact us on social media. We'd love to hear what you think about it, what your take on this topic is, because we know it's a very politically and you know nationalist, nationalistically charged topic. We'd love to get your take on it. I think that's enough from us. Let's get into this week's show. All right, first topic of the week, kind of following on what we talked about last week. Uh, first, I believe the first game, the first day of the World Cup, uh, a gay couple was beaten in uh in russia yeah right after the game they were a couple that had gotten a taxi together and after they had gotten their taxi two men in their 20s uh were who were connected to it beat the living shit out of them yeah one of them uh went to the hospital with a brain uh brain injury so pretty crazy um and another thing just to note like it was from a news article called from pink news and um there was a militia, uh, the Cossacks, I guess, uh, before the World Cup were brought in or they chose to come in and help the police during the World Cup yep. um, take down any gay propaganda or anything. Oh, okay. Because under Russian law, it's not yeah, like it's not permissible yep. to show anything other than like normal yeah. relationships. Um, just wanted to get your take on... What are the implications, I guess, like do, w- as if you were a member of this group, if you were gay, would you feel the need to go to the World Cup despite yeah. knowing that they're not going to welcome you? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's something that we've kind of touched on. Um, I I don't know. I mean, it, I think it's very courageous of them to have gone. I don't know. I don't know if I could say that I'd be that courageous i'm afraid to go now and i'm i'm like normal in their eyes right like i'm just a a white dude straight so um i can't imagine what going there and being someone that is uh, considered unnormal for them i I say i think that takes a lot of courage i can't say that i would would have the courage to, to do it um i mean it's it's pretty astonishing that i mean the first day and we, like we were, we post a lot of our stuff on Reddit, and it was funny because like on Reddit, people were just like, "Nothing's really happened there." Like, dude, the first day something has happened that has uh, in, uh, like 
affected people that are diverse and have some type of di- di- diversity in their lives. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's pretty horrendous. But, I mean, I, I think people knew that was going to be happening. I mean, that's not an excuse, obviously, but it is what I think we thought would would be happening. True. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's kind of like you said, we, we've, we've talked about this. It's been on people's radars for I don't know how long. And, you know, despite all of this, you think it, it shouldn't have been this. A, it should, I don't think it, it literally happened the first day of the World Cup. Two, it's like you spend so long talking about it and all of a sudden the World Cup happened. This really ties into last week's episode where a lot of people just kind of pretend like nothing's going on. Um, and just because it's not being widely reported on these like main major news stations, yeah. it's not doesn't mean it's not happening. You know what I mean? Like you have other instances of things like the Mexican fans are getting the Mexican Federation's getting fined because their fans were chanting gay chants at Manuel Neuer. Um, and then you also had a taxi driver drive into a group of Mexican supporters yeah. on like the third day of the World Cup and just like injuring a bunch of them in Moscow. And yeah. like there's a lot of crazy things happening. But to answer your question about like w- it, were I gay, would I go to the World Cup? I wouldn't um, just because I'm the kind of person that I don't like to be in situations like that even you know what i mean like i think that people who fight for their cause are very just i love that but i wouldn't go to like a regular anything just because i don't like being involved in things with a lot of people um, i know that sounds weird but no dude i'm right there with you <laughs> i uh I, I don't like like big crowds i make exceptions for soccer games but like i'm not a big fan of big crowds i'm not a mm-hmm. big fan of like things like that nature but i also just like I don't know. I don't think that I need to prove anything to anybody. I know who I am, and like that's good enough for me. Yeah. I understand that that's not everybody's take, and I understand that you need to fight for the things that you believe in. And a hundred percent, like there should be people at the World Cup, you know, waving uh, the gay pride flag and all of this. It's just absolutely disgusting that people, just because of their sexual orientation, are getting uh, assaulted, beaten, all of these things. I find that absolutely sickening. Yeah, and it's just. Man, I, I wish it didn't happen. I wish people yeah. could just go to the World Cup and just enjoy it, right? Just be there. You don't have to worry for your life. You just manage to – you just go. You have fun. You watch the games. You support and you be a supporter the way that you are everywhere else in the world. Um, and this is something that I think that you know FIFA really should take into consideration before awarding any tournament yeah. is political climate. It's things of, those, of that nature because if you have – if people's lives are in danger – yeah. Then you definitely shouldn't be putting the World Cup there. Absolutely. That being said, clearly FIFA does not give a fuck, and that has been a topic of conversation fuck you, for FIFA. Us several times. But yeah, um, I will say, hundred percent supportive of the people who do. They have way bigger yeah. nut sacks than I will yeah, ever that's have. What I'm saying. Like I, I feel like I'm, a pussy I'm way too much of a pussy. Like, I don't care what you say. Like yeah. I'm, I yeah. no, I would never because no, yeah, I, I would, I, I value my life more, I guess, yeah. than the cause I would. But depending, I don't know how strong I would yeah, feel. Right, but. Um, it's so funny too, like these things aren't really necessary getting the front page, but fans cleaning up trash do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the fans clean. I mean, that's yeah. a wicked cool thing too. But like, it's just like, oh, look at these fans clean up what they brought in. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like normally when I go to any sporting event, I clean up my trash yeah. too. Yeah. But maybe it's a different thing. No, out but there. this is to a different degree though. Like, yeah. These no. are the Japanese after every game. Like it's not just been this World Cup. It's like after every international yeah. game, all the Japanese fans will stop after before they leave they will stop and pick up every piece of trash they can see in the that's senegalese so. were actually yeah. there was a bunch a video of them oh, really? after their like historic win all their fans there they didn't like pick it up and throw it in trash bags but they picked it up and threw it all into one row so it was super easy for someone to come oh, nice. collect yeah well the that's japanese cool. it's funny the, the the from what i've read the country of japan is one of the cleanest countries you will ever see and I was reading this account Kauai. of this uh, American guy who lives in Japan, and he was talking about how weird it was to come home after, like, six years and be, like, how dirty everything in America is. All the sidewalks are dirty. Yeah. There's trash everywhere. It's just absurd. But I guess it's a very big cultural thing in Japan that, like, just huh. don't be dirty. Yeah. And so I'm sure I guess they don't leave their pop- leftover popcorn uh, in the aisles of movie oh, theaters. <laughs> It's um, like super normal here, but I I will say I at the end of a movie I don't necessarily take all the <laughs> trash. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have enough. You don't have enough. You don't have enough hands. hands. Don't have yeah. enough hands. You have enough. Yeah, or to the bring movie was so good that I just <laughs> absentmindedly <laughs> forgot yeah. about all my trash. But okay, transitioning to something a little more um, joyous, happy. Yeah, Mexico's historic result against Germany um, brought about something pretty cool in Mexico. Uh, Sisma, pretty cool. 
kind of scary. Yeah, right. yeah, but like kind of cool at the same time. Yeah, um, I get it. Yeah, Sisma Mexico, which is a d- department of oh. seismology and volcanism in Mexico, reported that there was an artificial mini earthquake that Dude. erupted um, at the same exact time that Mexico scored their goal, which is to me is just like bonkers. Unreal. That yeah. is so cool. That's like the entire country just boom exploded and like that for you to physically get that like on a seismology chart is unreal like imagine like you being part of a group of people who caused an earthquake yeah like that's yeah, pretty like, cool yeah. did this. like hey yeah. uh last year we caused an earthquake yeah like, that seems like such a cool thing to happen um i said scary because that terrified like, imagine yeah if, like, you weren't I mean, watching the world Cup. and especially for like mexico mexico city was devastated by an earthquake what was it last year or year and a half yeah, ago or recently. something like that so yes it is scary but at the same time like that is the physical representation of what one goal meant to mexico oh yeah like to me that's like fan if you're talking about fan culture that is like the pinnacle you've like yeah. created an almost natural disaster <laughs> because of how happy yeah. you were and kind From of how you love right. your country so much you, that almost you will killed almost everyone. destroy it <laughs> because you want to celebrate it yeah so i thought i mean i thought that was <laughs> awesome and it's like for for them having gone through such a like tragic event last year for it to be kind of a happy earthquake i don't know if that yeah, is, right? is the right way to say it it was like a joyous earthquake is kind of cool yeah but like no one can really top that right now I yeah mean, what it's like? Oh, what did your team do during the World Cup? It's like, well, our fan base created a artificial, <laughs> artificial earthquake. earthquake, so um, I think we win. Just one goal, too. Like, <laughs> imagine yeah. how, if they it's get like, far. Like yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, I will say the Mexican team looked good against yeah. uh, Germany. They have not been working on their finishing. Nope. Because nope. they could have been they, up like five nothing. They but, should have won five nothing. Yeah. But. but it was um. It was good to see that their counterattack game was strong, but this podcast isn't about that. Sorry, so their I shorts don't. were nice. I love them, like their jerseys and stuff. Yeah, the maroon shorts. They I didn't, have. I didn't. I didn't like their jerseys in like before the World Cup, but seeing it live, it, it looks pretty really cool. nice. Yeah, very nice. But all right, guys, moving on to our third and final news topic of the week. There is about to be a major beer shortage in Russia during the World Cup. Uh oh. Uh, this is terrible news for anybody in russia so at first you think oh man i gotta worry about crazy hooligans if you know i have to worry about all this stuff crazy taxi drivers now you might have to worry about not being able to get any beer uh the reason this is is that there's a shortage of co2 um it's the gas that carbonates the beer and supplies are dwindling at a rapid rate in the wake of the world cup and summertime weather so in other words people are drinking so much during the world cup that they are running out of beer but they can't necessarily produce more because the Russian government had kind of uh, to reduce the amount of ammonia plants uh, or I'm sorry, they were shutting down ammonia plants for maintenance work. And because of that, they like they don't have as much CO2 uh, okay. because CO2 is a byproduct of ammonia production. So yeah. like they don't have the natural gas to then carbonate the beer. And because yeah. they're producing so much, they just can't keep up with the demand. So hopefully someone will find a way to import more beer yeah. because wow. this seems like we're not even what are we a week we are exactly yeah. a week into the world cup there are still three more weeks yeah. of the Holy world cup. shit yeah. there needs to be beer for yeah. another three weeks two things on that one i can understand why it's running out so quickly because i saw a picture like okay russia completely different than the united states where you could don't have to just get two beers at the same time they actually have these like little trays that you put on top of the can uh, of the cups and you can hold eight beers per hand so people are walking around with like 16 cups of beer holy shit buy that in one serving i mean you can just crush that invention (laughs) when i saw it on i was actually here's i'm gonna give credit to barstool despite the fact that they never care about soccer ever they brought this to my attention they i I saw that being posted on their website and i was like oh my god that is genius And the fact that we don't have that here in the yeah. United States is absurd to me. I've been at several sporting events where trying to grab beer and food is a huge hassle. Yeah. Especially because, like, you don't want to get up. You don't want to bring three people with you. You're so trying like, to get all your beer in one, in one, in one trip. One foul swoop. Yeah, and not have to keep getting up during the game, be annoying, you know what I mean? So Right. So whoever decided to make a very simple cardboard box that holds that many beers, yeah. kudos to you. You might be at fault for making the beer run out, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, I wonder how much is actually drank and how much is wasted because you can get as much as you want. I'm yeah. sure it's a lot of a distraint, though. Hey, we don't we don't waste alcohol, man. Yeah. Uh, and second to that, 
if you do run it if you are in russia for the world cup right now and you're listening to this thank uh, you very much yeah take, right you must have other things to do but you're listening to us i love you take um a page out of Colombia's notebook and just buy fake binoculars and smuggle in vodka through the nice. binoculars i saw a video of them sneaking alcohol and they had a fake pair of binoculars the thing actually unscrews the it, it like serves as yeah it's a flask binocular flask where the the lens unscrews you oh pour God, your man. shot in there, rip your shot. Genius. It's totally wow. good. That's pretty tight. Now, uh, in first you have to worry about the drunk fans, right? But now <laughs> you have to worry about the fans who are really upset about not, not having, being drunk yeah, and which, not being able. Damn, that might be more dangerous. Yeah, so right? my question is, you definitely move towards hard liquor, right? Like, let's say in yeah. a week they run out of beer. I mean, it's you just vodka. I mean, if you're going to assimilate to the Russian culture, it might as well just start. Pounding vodka. We're going to see yeah. some rampant fans then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot more wild, I think. All right, guys. So this week we're going to be talking about something I think is, is super relevant right now and, and, and very important, and that is the diversification of national teams. You look at teams like Germany, um, Portugal, Spain, teams that – on the surface, look like they're just made up by German players. But if you actually go through and, and look at the roster, they have players like Diego Costa, who was a Brazilian pl- Brazilian player. They have players like Diego Costa, who is Brazilian, born and raised, um, but ended up playing for the Spanish national team. Pepe, same Brazilian player, ended up playing for the Portuguese team. Germany's team has is filled with um, Turkish-born players like Ozil, Gundogan, you know, Kadira, right? Um, so they, we're seeing this kind of diversification of national teams where teams aren't just made up by the all American or all German or all Spanish. You're, you're really starting to see a mix of, of different cultures and um, different races, whatever it may be on this international stage playing for different countries. So the kind of question we wanted to ask ourselves and, and, and kind of get some input on is what kind of impact do we think this has not only for the fans that are trying to support the teams, but for the teams having players of, of different cultures and different backgrounds playing on the same pitch. Right. It's a very interesting topic because, you know, when the World Cup came about, it's basically like your country versus another country, right? So it's like, you know, you're very – it's supposed to technically be, right? You have these players who are from this country. They, they are citizens of this country. They represent this country, and they play for this country. And, you know, the interesting case about Diego Costa is that he's actually played – two friendlies for wearing a brazil jersey but because they weren't official uh they didn't matter i guess fifa allowed him to switch once over to play for spain thing about him is born in brazil raised in brazil you know lived in brazil for his early life went to spain got a spanish passport decided to play for spain um you know he did this because during, I think, 2010, the coach wouldn't call him up for the World Cup or he wouldn't call him up for team for games or whatever. And then he got pissed off, yep. said, you know what? I'm not playing for Brazil anymore. I'm going to go play for Spain. Played in the 2014 World Cup, now playing in the 2018 World Cup. Yep. Scored, you know, already twice for, for Spain. Um, Dick. <laughs> yeah, Brazilians hate him. Brazilians absolutely Three times, hate him. no? Because he's three, 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 three goals. Oh, he scored, he scored two he scored in the first one, and then yeah, yesterday. My bad, I forgot that. We don't talk about was... scores though. My so bad. Sorry. sorry. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't My know. Bad. The World Cup's a little different. <laughs> so the guy is, you know, in other words, he's the second leading yeah. goal scorer at the World Cup right now right. for Spain. Um, and and the Brazilians hate him because in the 2014 World Cup we needed a center forward. Yeah. We needed a center forward Stuck badly. <laughs> And because the previous coach had pissed him off so much, we didn't have that option because yeah. he was already playing for Spain at this point in 2014. He was already in that lineup, you know what I mean? So at that point, it didn't matter. But Brazilians absolutely despise Diego yeah. Costa. Yeah. Um, and for, for people wondering how that's possible, and, and Louis kind of touched upon it, but so basically the, the way it works is if as long as you don't play an, uh, an official match for a, c- a country, like Diego Costa had played the friendlies, um, if you become a natu- uh, Naturalized. Naturalized in another country, and they invite you to come play an official match, and you do, then you're stuck with them kind of in, in that sense. So FIFA allows you to switch over once. Right, once. It's not like a oh, matter okay, of like – Okay, I was going to say because he had played six Brazil. Friendlies right, for six different right. clubs and for then, six different uh, countries. And then you can switch over. But then but once then you make that official – You can't go back. Hey, you're stuck. Once you make an official appearance, you are right. not allowed to switch. Wow. Yeah, So and we see this a lot with um, youth players nowadays. I mean, a lot of guys that are born in kind of these diverse um, – 
family dynamics. You maybe um, I'm, th- I'm trying to think of one right now, like um, Adnan Yanazai, a random one. But he at one point had the option of playing for like four different nationalities because of the way his family is broken up. So sorry, I didn't interrupt. I actually have the quote. He had the extreme example of Adnan Yanazai is that he could pick up to seven wow, national are, teams. We are really in sync, Louis. Oh, this is weird <laughs> to know. It's crazy. Seven national. Seven national teams. He was born in Belgium. Um, and his parents fled war in Kosovo, and he uh, grew up in Kosovo. So he could have played for Kosovo, Serbia, Croatia, Albania, Turkey, or England. So pick of the litter. Pick wow. of the litter. This man could have played for a handful of clubs. He ended countries. up picking. He ended up picking Belgium. Yep. And okay, so this is this is a good kind of top um, topic point here, and it's we see this a kind of extreme example. Of, and I mean that's ridiculous to have the option of seven seven teams like that. Do we think that that should be allowed? I mean, to to an extent, seven nations is pretty ridiculous, right? Like, I can understand maybe the country you grew up in. I mean, I no, I, I totally understand that one. I understand maybe the one for your parents, but then where does it? Where do you kind of cut, draw the line as to, as to being like okay? Because there's no way he has a direct relation with seven countries. I I wouldn't think. So right. a lot of it is like, you know, Albania was where his parents were born. Uh, Turkey was the homeland of his father's parents. Croatia was from his mother's ancestry. And he grew up in England. Right. So it's just like it's such a strange thing um, for those in, for us in the U.S. Uh, immigration and naturalization laws are a little bit more clear cut, I guess, yeah. than in Europe, because yeah. in Europe, the countries are very they're much smaller. Some countries at one point, you know, for example, you had the, the, the country that was Yugoslavia. Right. It then broke up into so many different countries nowadays um, that it's just like there's a lot of things like yeah. that that happen in Europe. But um, at the end of it, it's almost like. I don't know. It, it, you have. It is extreme. I don't. Th- I don't personally think you should be able to pick seven different. Where do you draw the line? To me, I draw the line pretty simply. I think that if you are born in a country, you can play for that country. Okay. But if you are also a citizen of another country and you've spent a majority of your life there, that's the other one. Okay. Um. But at the same time, you see that. Uh. It. It's difficult to say that. Right? Yeah. Because how do you right. tell someone like, for example, in the, in the in the example of Pepe, who grew born in Brazil, grew up in Brazil played his youth youth soccer in Brazil, got to Portugal when he was like early 20s and then spent, you know, I think about five years there, became a Portuguese citizen. How do you tell him he's not Portuguese if he spent what he considers a significant amount of his time right. in Portugal? Right. Um, but then he then goes and spends a decade living in Spain. So Pepe, in theory, had he never played for in, in Portugal, he could have gone and played in Spain and become right. Spanish, right? right? But it's difficult because... Um, it's hard, man. I think that for as a Brazilian, we're very nas- nationalistic, spe- only usually when it only comes to soccer right. versus you know other things people really don't care about. Um, it's difficult, and we've seen this in the United States men's national team as well. Because when Jurgen Klinsmann was the the head coach, he actually brought a lot of German-born American quote unquote American players. Yeah, but they actually had some issues because some of those players couldn't really speak English all that well. Yeah. And so it became an issue of, like, how do you communicate? How do you truly, you know, get on the same page? You know, they had a lot of players who were, yeah, maybe they were born to American parents but lived in Germany, spent their whole lives in Germany, don't really speak English all that well. If they did, they had, like, you know, broken accents or whatever yeah. it was. It's difficult because this question really encompasses, like, what makes you – You. You, right? <laughs> it's like what makes each of these people – their own personalities what is their nationality and that's kind of the thing that you have to kind of answer on your own yeah um but one funny example is that i found this very interesting uh mario fernandez he's the right back for russia uh he's been starting every game for russia since the start of the world cup and he actually decided to play for russia because he didn't think he had a chance to play for brazil he also has a cap for the brazilian national team in a friendly against japan mm-hmm. funniest part about that goes to play for russia and then Dani alves gets hurt Brazil needs a right back. Uh-huh. He had the potential to actually play for Brazil during this World Cup, yeah. but he opted to play for Russia. Yeah. So it's also like what, uh, you know, a lot of players, they see international soccer the same way that they see club soccer. It's just a business for them. It's yeah. like, well, if I'm 20 and I really want to play in a World Cup, if I can't do it for my country, is there a way I can do it for another country? Yeah. Um, and so Mario Fernandez has been playing in Russia for several years. He got his Russian passport. Now he's starting for Russia. He's yeah. starting right back for Russia. Um, so in my, at a very long-winded explanation of my answer on this is that I think that it should be 
the country you're born in or the country that you feel is like, of course you have to have a, a, a passport for this country, but the country you feel is what you identify with. Yeah. Like, okay. B. My line is drawn at where you are born. Yeah. If your parents are, f- were born and are from a different country different before they bring you into this yeah. new country where you're born. Yeah. So they're still like dual citizens yeah. per se. And then if, like Louis said, if you move to a place and you feel Nationalism. such a connection yeah. with that. And I think it's it's interesting for a fan to kind of conceptualize that because we would never understand what a person feels like when they move somewhere new. Right. And like if they're playing professional soccer and they're loved by this, this country that they're now playing right. in. Um, but on paper, it looks really weird. To yeah. us, I mean, Morocco had the five Dutch-born players. Like, yeah. that's weird as shit. Not to mention, I think, 17. So, Morocco has a total of 17 foreign-born players. Yeah. And you said five of them being Dutch. I think there was 11, or it was like five, or 10 of them were French-born. Yeah. And it's, one of them is Portuguese-born. Yeah. So, it's that's it's interesting. And, like, you don't know their stories. Like, who's to say they didn't leave Morocco to go live, right. like, and else. get a better life. Yeah. But it's just... It's weird to see that on paper and be like, dang, like there's how many actual Moroccans are from Morocco and like are living in Morocco that are like playing, playing. there. It's yeah. like that's interesting. But so so you bring up a you bring up an interesting point that I want to touch upon, and that's the fan, um, the fan and the player. We we've we've seen an interesting case with Lionel Messi. I mean, one of probably what well, most people would consider. Um, Maybe not not Brazilians, but most people consider one of the best players ever in the history of, of the sport. Born in Argentina at a very young age, moves to Spain, Barcelona. Um, I, I'm sure any team in the any national team in the world would love to have him as their own. But if you look at the Argentinians, they actually are unhappy with him. They when he re- announced his retirement, they were happy after their kind of like devastating season, uh, international campaign that they had. They were happy that he was leaving. He, since the beginning of time, playing for Argentina has kind of been the the ugly duckling that Argentina doesn't yeah, really that's w- mad fucking good <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want to really claim. Um, and it, it's it's it, it's interesting, right? Because from from a fan's perspective, it's hard to determine. And like you're saying, like it's hard to determine this guy's story. Like, why would Messi pick Argentina versus maybe Spain, where he spent his entire life? Does he really have a connection to the to the Argentine people, to the national team? Uh, so I wanted to, to kind of get your feedback on that. Do you think it's? I don't know how to uh, to pose the question necessarily, but do you think it's something of just? time or, or even if you're not spending much time there like say Diego Costa but maybe he assimilates to the culture really well right and I'm thinking of that because also Germany has been experiencing some issues with their kind of Turkish born players and the issue right now is that uh, in, a, in a brief summary is that like Ozol and Gundogan they were claiming um, that their president was the new Turkish dictator I don't even know his Erdogan. name Erdogan I think so right yeah they basically there was like I guess it was like a thing on Twitter or on the internet where uh they basically I think someone like tweeted it was like my president yeah it was a picture it was of the Ozo, Turkish it was, it was Ozo or Gundogan it, um tweeted out something like I that I think both of them have had yeah. it's it's been Instances it wasn't just it. one of them they both kind of had those sentiments yeah. of like uh talking about like the Turkish president or prime minister wherever his yeah. title is yeah. as their as, kind as of their, head of state right but it's like you know, you they play are they they play for the German national team, right? So I think that there's that. Th- what I'm trying to say is, um, from from a player's perspective, do you have to really assimilate to the culture for for the fans to to get behind you? And beca- the reason I'm asking that is because Ozil and now are now getting a lot of shit from German players from their own. F- I mean, f- German fans, sorry, from their own fans. They're stepping on the field, and Germans are, are booing them. So yeah. it's something off the field related that they're that they're not accepting. It's because these guys aren't really assimilating to the culture, which is strange because when you consider that two of Germans Germany's best players in their history were born in Poland, right? Miroslav Klose, Polish. Yeah. Lukas Podolski, Polish. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think because of the circumstances that have uh, that have happened in the 20th century where you know Germany decided to take over the whole world yeah uh that kind of a for me like you know anybody born in Poland go play for Germany you have yeah. more than a right to yeah. like everything that's happened with that by all means but it's a different thing it's like how can you really be upset with your players for wanting for for uh, you're right it's such a difficult thing that it's just like from a fan's perspective, how do you get behind it? Do you just right. kind of do it because right. they're playing for your 
uh, nationality the same way that you would just kind of get behind whatever player was playing right. for your club? Or do you really, really care about yeah. who plays for your team? Yeah. Like, it's very interesting because it, it doesn't really happen in Brazil. All of Brazil is usually made up of Brazilian. They, I don't think I've ever uh, I've ever seen an, a foreign born player no. play for Brazil. Yeah, they don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of talent. But on the flip side of it, the two countries that have the most foreign born like players in this World Cup, um, I'm going to rephrase this to so make a little bit more sense. There are 53 players born in France that are playing in foreign or in other countries at the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, the second most players is Brazil with, I think, 23 players mm -hmm. born in Brazil who are currently playing for other countries in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting mix where, you know, you have a lot of these players born in, other co born in a country playing for other ones. Um, but from a fan's perspective, I don't know. Like, what do you, I think, do you just I think, accept it? I think that... I, I I don't I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say that I would accept it. I I think I want to see the person actually show that they want to play for the country, and by that I mean I want them to be German, right? Assimilate to the cultures, and that's not saying don't be true to yourself, but like w in my mind, you move to a country, you try to adopt their their rituals, their their customs, their whatever it may be. To become one, right? So you, you come to America, you, you speak your Spanish, but le learn to speak English. It, it, it go to Germany, you learn to speak German, you assimilate to their cultures. In my mind, I, that's what I would think I would want to see as a fan. And, and with Messi, I think what they haven't seen from him is really the passion for Argentina. I mean, he doesn't really have, and this is coming from Brazilian, it doesn't seem like he really has that kind of Argentine culture within him. It almost seems like he only goes back to Argentina when he's playing well, soccer. Right. It's like he he's he's called up for the, for the national team. Okay, I come back to Argentina and enjoy there. But it does, right, it doesn't seem like he is Argentine. But it <laughs> feels weird to kind of criticize him for that because it's like you, from a regular person's life, if imagine you had a buddy, right, who got a, an amazing job in Barcelona, right. decided that he wants to go live in Spain and now he has this amazing life in Spain, would you really judge him for not really right. coming back? No, not necessarily, but it's like People judge the players because it's it's such a nationalistically charged conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Especially with the rise of nationalism too. Right. Like German. Like I'm sure the normal German or even like the the more liberal Germans are totally fine with it. But like the AFD the is like, yeah. no, like yeah. this can't happen. Yeah. And that's that's like a sad fact. I think we're living in today. Just like the rise of nationalism yeah. only is. Oh, I don't know about if we're seeing the rise of nationalism. Look I at how many know. wars have been fought because of nationalism in the last 150 no, years. No, I'm saying like within the last like five, ten years. Like yeah, but I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think that there's been a, a big rise. I mean, look at what's happening in the U.S. now. Look at what's happening in England. We have so many British politicians backing Trump and the regime that, that is kind of being established right now. I think that we are seeing um, in, in, in different parts of the world an, a, a second rise of nationalism that is causing some pretty grotesque things to happen in the u.s i don't want to bring the politics in it of what's happening here um we are seeing some some shades <laughs> um of, of kind of nationalism rising again but but messi is one of those guys just to get it back on topic like he's one of those outliers it's like the, the people don't like him really but he was born there he lives in spain but he always comes back home to yeah. play it's like that older brother that comes home like on christmas yeah it's but i wonder like, if he came back just because maybe there's argentina well yeah, here's the thing i think that what it was is that it, the weirdest part to me and the scariest thing is that had he decided to play for spain i think spain probably would have won three world cups instead of just yeah. the one yeah um because for a long time they really didn't have a forward yeah and even to this day you see teams park the bus so hard against them because they just want to pass the ball around you and walk it into the back of the net which is why Messi works so well at, at Barcelona is because they pass, pass, pass. They get the ball to him when he's finally open, and he can capitalize on it on an instant, right? Yeah. Um, but I think for him, it was a matter of if he wants to be the best in the world, he's got to be better than the people he gets compared to. Born in Argentina, he's going to get compared to Maradona yeah. every step of the way. So for him, it, the people, people across the world call him the best player in the world. You will not hear anybody in South America, the entire yeah. continent of South America, I yeah. think, say that Messi is the best player that's ever yeah. lived. I mean, yeah, he's still very much in the shadows of Maradona. I think when Maradona is in the stands of the games, it's a it's yeah. an added pressure that yeah. he doesn't oh, need. Yeah, oh, without a doubt. Um, they see you see that camera pan to him. It's like, uh oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of like, it's kind of like that whole. It's like the MJ LeBron kind of thing. We're like, but too good, whole different level, right? Yeah. Um, but. I, 
to kind of bring it back on topic, I personally don't think that there's anything wrong with the kind of mix of cultures in the national in, in national teams because I think it reflects very much the diversity of a country, right? Some countries like Brazil, if you're looking at it statistically, aren't necessarily that diverse in terms of people coming from other countries going in and trying to play um, and not trying to play and just just in general like migrating to Brazil. Brazil is very Brazilian in that sense. Um, Whereas I don't agree with that. Brazil has a lot uh, of foreign influence. They have in a lot of, of, uh, of people immigrating. Asian. I, I do agree with that. But to that but it when you translate to, to, to football, yeah, I mean, a lot of that happened during er- eras of war that have happened. I don't think now the immigration in Brazil, immigra- Brazil is not experiencing an immigration problem where people are trying to move into the country. As far as you know. Right, right. People are it, emigrating it, out is, of it is diverse to that sense where they, they experienced that at one point, but it isn't now. Um, whereas countries like Germany, they in a lot of countries in Europe, have experienced the, the rush of um, different cultures coming in now. You've seen the whole refugee issues. The U.S. Have ha- has had that and a lot of people have been saying the U.S. should have a better team because we are so diverse. We have all these different cultures here. Um, so I personally don't think that there's any issue with national teams being made up of people born in different nations and what, whatever it may be. I just think that um, th- like, there has to be interest from the players. Yeah. Because for me, an international, an international team shouldn't – be looked at from a business standpoint in that sense i think that if you're gonna if you're gonna say yes to a nation and, and you're you're if you accepted citizenship you're now a, a, a citizen of that country and you want to play for that country's national team you really have to pr- show that that has become your, your life yeah so i agree with you right there i think that a lot of especially in countries like the united states in germany where you have a lot of different foreign influences because that's just you know america's a melting pot you have so many different kinds of of cultures here it makes perfect sense you know i was born in brazil i came to the u.s at the age of four i consider myself equally brazilian and american my pa- we speak portuguese in my house i have very traditional brazilian customs in my own home but that being said the older i get the more and more i'm i see myself like even doing more things that are very american at home right but you know what i mean i consider myself 50 yeah. 50 right but I have want to pose a question. What I have an issue with, and I want to get you guys' opinion on this, is there was a lot of talk of when Jurgen Klinsmann was the head coach of him almost trying to persuade players that weren't necessarily American at all, yep. but just happened to have connections with America to come play for the American national team right. or the United States national team. And a lot of people in the United States took issue with it, and even some of the players were having an issue with it because I was reading accounts of – some of the players talking about their last World Cup qualifying campaign, and it almost felt like, um, at least when Jurgen Klinsmann was around, that it almost felt like some players didn't give a shit. They were yeah. just like, whatever, I'm here because I want to be an international player, mm-hmm. not because I want to be a United States mm-hmm. player. So they had no pride for the country. They had no pride for the flag. So mm-hmm. that, I think, is the issue where it's like, if you're just playing to be on the international stage because that's what you think a good soccer player should do, then you're not doing the country any justice. Like... To, I know it's hard to talk about because, you know, when the way I see it is if you have people who, you know, after scoring an amazing goal for their country, they're going to start crying. They're going to have like this show of emotion because they love their country so Sing, much. Like, singing a national anthem. Things like right. that. I don't want that to be lost just because, you know, I'm a good soccer player. I have the potential to play for X country. I should go do it for whatever, but I'm not fully invested. Mm-hmm. So what's your take on that? Do you think that it's wrong for coaches to try and persuade players to come play just because it might give them a better chance at winning yeah um i'll let b take this before i dive in um i would say yes but in his um just for his cause like i guess who's his sorry uh clemson jurgen um he was given a team who i guess we didn't really think much of you know you never really think much of the united states yeah I definitely disagree with the fact that he shouldn't have been necessarily just trying to get any old player. I think you'd need a little bit more research and stuff to like maybe try and get them to get the whole idea of the United States yeah. down. But in his eyes, he was just trying to help the United States win a cup. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily the worst thing in the world. Because, yeah. I mean, there are other nations who do that, too. Yeah. Probably with a bunch of money and stuff. Yeah. We just don't probably didn't have a lot of money to give yeah. them. 
so uh, so off of that to, it, that brings up a few topics um like i said i don't want international football to become a business um so i i don't personally like that idea because i think that's then become that becomes a transfer market right it's sure you can only do it once once you convince them but, but it's but it's yeah. still a transfer market there's the issue there of then not even the players but does your head coach need to be need to be from within the country and we talked about this when we spoke about um the vacant um US men's national team position, uh coaching position and if if the the coach needs to be american i think that you don't necessarily need a uh, a coach to be from there but they need a they need to have a full grasp of what that co- that team means for the country and what it means to be playing for that jersey i think that we see that a lot of south american countries uh, the, the passion i mean you see the guys crying on the in a lot of african nations as well that are kind of made up by these these people that are, are, are from there they have that passion they have the the desire and and you see that on the pitch we saw it with mexico i mean look at look at what they the performance they put out against germany players that are there they're completely invested they're not just there for the cap when you start recruiting players and, and getting players that just kind of have that tie because their grandma's grandma was American or whatever it may be, you lose that because you just don't have that emotion for it. You just don't care. If you lose a game, you see them, they're just, they, they'll just they still swap the shirts and get right out and go into the locker room and fly out to wherever club they're, they're going back to. So I don't, I don't like that because I think at the end of the day, international football is kind of the epitome of of what footballing is and we see it in the world cup and that is just like this sport that's supposed to unite you no matter what you look at england so many clubs so many rivalries but when it comes world cup season everyone bands together they're all traveling to russia together they're all supporting england they think it's coming back home right so for me international football kind of captures everything that we think the sport really is when you start getting players on the pitch that don't really give a shit about what the they're country, doing they're, the they're flag, just they're the... just there for that cap like you say they're just there to say oh on my resume i'm an internationally capped player 56 times who cares what country it's for? right to them it doesn't matter you lose that completely because then the the fans lose interest in you it goes back to just being just being soccer just being about the money and it, as a fan i don't want to see that so i actually am going to take the i don't agree with you in terms of i think a coach should be from that country yeah. for the exact same reasons you just mentioned. Of course, it's a little bit less stringent because they're not the ones on the pitch. And if they're a really good like you know, master tactician, they can put players mm-hmm. on the field who have that passion and energy. Yeah. But I will, make, I will put one statistic out and I will move on. Um, out of the 20 World Cups that have ever been won, every single one has been won by a coach from that country. Right. No foreign-born coach has ever won a World Cup. Yeah. No, and I I, I remember yeah, look, we've we've talked about this stuff before. I, I for sure, I I yeah I it's hard. I I don't think I don't think that a coach yeah, yeah it, it's hard. I don't think that a coach needs to be from there. Like I've already said, I think that he, but he, they as the leader of the team they need to demonstrate that. And maybe that that's a good uh, counterpoint to my own argument is like how can you really show the passion for the country if you're not there and if your head leader isn't from there, he's just not going to have that. So maybe maybe that just just dispelled my own argument. But um, yeah, I mean I think that um, that stat alone would make you think that you you should always be hiring from within. Um, but then again, it's like. If you're just hiring in the, in America's stance, right? If you're just hiring the American-born guy and maybe not the guy who's lived here his entire life, but is Mexican by nature, right? Um, you we kind of miss out on maybe that diversification, but whatever, maybe it's just, it, it's super interesting to see um, how fans react to that. What did you think of when Jurgen was America's head coach then? I didn't. I don't. I don't. I necessarily didn't like it. Yeah, I'm not. I wasn't too sold on him. Sure, yeah. he he. I don't know. I never really liked him too much. I thought yeah. that, you know, we got some great results when he was he was the head coach. Like, you know, I can never forget uh, Jermaine Jones' last-minute uh, equalizer against Portugal to send mm-hmm. them into the knockout stage of the last World Cup. Mm-hmm. Like, that was absurd, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, great results. But um, that being said, I don't know. I didn't – overall, I didn't really like him too much. You weren't, back, you weren't backing him maybe for the same reasons that we've mentioned other players not being backed, right? right? But I thought it was titty, dude. I was like, dude, we got a German coach that's you thought it was cool. yeah, 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 I thought okay. it was cool because like that was me, I guess, like uh, more of just like a sideline fan, I guess. Right. 
but but maybe too you had the bias of like thinking oh this german guy is going to bring a revolution to, yeah, to uh, the americans yeah. but right overall though what's your stance on foreign born coaches foreign born coaches i'm all for it if yeah. we believe i mean if if the if the country believes that this this guy is worth his weight and like yeah can have some sort of impact on players, maybe bring a new feel to what we haven't seen before, which mm-hmm. we, I'm pretty sure we believed it was going to happen with the United States. But like Louis said, like it would be really fucking hard to get that team all the way to the end without being yeah, like just showing the same pride intrinsically because you've always been yeah. here. I think it's especially difficult for the U S because MLS isn't that big of a, a league. People aren't really watching it. So if maybe if you get a call up from, from the na- U S national team and you're not from here, say you accept it, you don't really know anything about how the football is played here in the U S because you have no um, real association to it. So it might be harder for you to really establish that kind of loyalty with the fans and, and even the players, because you don't really know them. You might just see them in highlights for um, kind of a research process. Yeah, but right. It's like, yeah, who's this guy? Yeah, Where is he from? Right. Um, so you really don't understand. So to, to, to Louis' point again, for sure, I can see it. I mean, you, you want the person that's best qualified, but I think that um, maybe for an international coach, one of the biggest things on their resume might be that they need to be – from the country, know the country, yeah. Um, as opposed to kind At of just be a that citizen of that country, yeah, and just yeah. love the country, right. right? Um, so one final point, my my cousin always says this, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, I agree with him too. It's you know, if you were to boil down a World Cup, in his mind, he thinks that a World Cup should be the best everything from your country versus the best everything from another country. So you know, a World Cup. Uh, squad isn't just the players. You have the backroom staff, you have the tr- technical staff, the training staff, the coach, the head coach, the assistant manager, all of these things. In his mind, all of those positions should be filled from people of that country. Yeah, that'd because, be interesting. Because the idea behind it is like, is my country better than your country? Yeah. I know this is like, yeah, I'm yeah. boiling it down to a very basic level, um, but that's kind of how he sees it and how he still thinks it should be. Of course, like that was how it was back in the early days of the, of international soccer. But today we live in such a globalized world that I don't even know if that's possible. Yeah, everything that we're talking about here is very interesting and it's very very. I love the the aspects of it, but it's also like we're living in a ever growing, more globalized society, like globally, right? And so it's like, where does it go? Like, at what yeah. point do we still continue to have? I feel like it'd be harder at this point. Like, it's like, well, I don't know. He's like, he lives here for so long, but he's like way fucking better than any yeah. other backroom staff we have. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to go with the American. Yeah. But, but then again, I think <laughs> that's interesting. I don't It'd think cool. that disqualifies any of our points because no. it's like, you know, I, I'm if Brazilian. That person feels that they are part of that country. Right. Like, so I'm a Brazilian American. Like, for me, I feel equally comfortable be calling myself a Brazilian the same way as I feel equally comfortable calling myself an American. Um, so for me, if like Brazil, let's say I got a job as like Brazil's head masseuse, right? <laughs> I was just like, Hey man, come massage, come massage with me, <laughs> come massage Neymar's thighs. I would do it in an instant and I wouldn't feel weird because for me, it's like, I am Brazilian, even though I haven't lived there since I was four. And the last time I went into the country was nine years ago, but I still feel very Brazilian. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, let's say, I got called up and they're like, hey, man, you want to be the head masseuse of Canada? I'd be like, uh, sure, but, like, I'm not Canadian. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I might not feel as intrinsically motivated by the flag of Canada as yeah. I would for the Brazilian flag. Yeah. And, of course, some people think nationalism is pretty bad yeah. considering all the stuff that it's caused. True. But I don't know. I don't see it that way, I guess. But Yeah, it, if, if it were to be... 100 percent like your own nationality it would be quite the tournament to watch i feel like <laughs> yeah well we'd be seeing a lot of different i mean even in terms of if that were the case we'd be seeing a lot of different um experience even from the fans like i'd say like iran iran has women watching football for the first time ever since like 1976 um, yeah actually going to stadiums and watching games because they can't actually watch it in their home country right True. so that whole experience would be completely different i think it um i think that nationalism has to be used for good. I think it's like it, nationalism right now and, and in the past has been, it's almost like religion where they're using it as the kind of, they're using it as a scapegoat for doing bad things. Um, nationalism can be amazing, if but your sense of nationalism has, has to encompass that 
your nation might not be just one race or just one culture, right? Your nation might be made up of different people. Um, but when you start thinking like, oh, our, our nationalities are, we are just white, that's oh, not good. But I love your point there, though. Like, nationalism isn't about, like, our country's better than you, so we're going to go take over your country right. or we're going to go just take over the world. It's a matter of, like, nationalism should be intrinsic. It should be inward facing yeah, it, where it's like, we have, you know what I mean? Like, culture came out of, you know, history. It's like, you know, some con- cultures eat a lot of fish because they're a fishing, predominantly fishing country. They're near the water right. a lot. And like fucking you Denmark, know, the worst fish ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have a lot of different things like that. So, you know, it, culture comes out of the inside of the country. Right. So nationalism should be the same thing. Like you should use nationalism to spur on your country for growth, right. not to take over the world, not to, right. you know, do stupid shit. Yeah. But I think your point is major. Major key here is like, do not use nationalism as the excuse right. to be a dickwad. Mm, absolutely. No. Yeah. I mean, I think I think we we've touched upon a lot of good points today, and we could probably have a whole different podcast on a lot more relating to this subject. But um, for the sake of the listeners, not having a three-hour podcast or three, <laughs> three-parter, um, I think this is a good a good cutoff point. Unless you guys have any closing remarks. No, I mean, closing remarks, I just think it's fascinating to watch how uh, different players with different nationalities play on one national one national team. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating. I think it's I think it's great because it does show the kind of growth of uh, that whole unity that mm-hmm. we talk about for the World Cup. But at the same time, it's just so fascinating. Yeah. Fucking bring on week two. Yeah. Let's do it. So that's it for this episode. I know we covered a lot. I know for sure that you have some opinions on what we've said today. Please be sure to send us a message, comment in the video if you're you're watching this, or send us an email with your thoughts. And if you haven't yet, leave us that five-star review. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you in next week's episode.